government. This is the system that we have today. If the government loses a confidence vote in the assembly, it must resign. La Fontaine, a champion of democracy and French language rights, became the first leader of a responsible government in the Canadas. Image of Sir Louis Hippolyte La Fontaine with caption Sir Louis Hippolyte La Fontaine, a champion of French language rights, became the first head of a responsible government similar to a prime minister in Canada in 1849. Confederation From 1864 to 1867, representatives of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and the province of Canada, with British support, worked together to establish a new country. These men are known as the Fathers of Confederation. They created two levels of government, federal and provincial. The old province of Canada was split into two new provinces, Ontario and Quebec, which together with New Brunswick and Nova Scotia formed the new country called the Dominion of Canada. Each province would elect its own legislature and have control of such areas as education and health. The British Parliament passed the British North America Act in 1867. The Dominion of Canada was officially born on July 1, 1867. Until 1982, July 1st was celebrated as Dominion Day to commemorate the day that Canada became a self-governing Dominion. Today it is officially known as Canada Day. Image of the Fathers of Confederation with caption The Fathers of Confederation established the Dominion of Canada on July 1st, 1867, the birth of the country that we know today. Image of Dominion of Canada, $1 bill with caption Dominion of Canada, $1 bill 1923, showing King George V, who assigned Canada's national colors, white and red, in 1921, the colors of our national flag today. Dominion from Sea to Sea Sir Leonard Tilley, an elected official and father of Confederation from New Brunswick, suggested the term Dominion of Canada in 1864. He was inspired by Psalm 72 in the Bible, which refers to dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. This phrase embodied the vision of building a powerful, united, wealthy, and free country that spanned a continent. The title was written into the Constitution, was used officially for about a hundred years, and remains part of our heritage today. Expansion of the Dominion The following list identifies when the provinces and territories became part of Canada. 1867, Ontario, Quebec, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick. 1870, Manitoba and the Northwest Territories. 1871, British Columbia. 1873, Prince Edward Island. 1880, the Arctic Islands were transferred to the Northwest Territories. 1898, the Yukon Territory. 1905, Alberta and Saskatchewan. 1949, Newfoundland and Labrador. 1999, Nunavut. Did you know, in the 1920s, some believed that the British West Indies, British territories in the Caribbean Sea, should become part of Canada. This did not occur, though Canada and Commonwealth Caribbean countries and territories enjoy close ties today. Canada's First Prime Minister In 1867, Sir John Alexander Macdonald, a father of Confederation, became Canada's first Prime Minister. Born in Scotland on January 11, 1815, he came to Upper Canada as a child. He was a lawyer in Kingston, Ontario, a gifted politician, and a colourful personality. Parliament has recognised January the 11th as Sir John A. Macdonald Day. His portrait is on the $10 bill. Caption Image of Sir John Macdonald 
Sir George Etienne Cartier was the key architect of Confederation from Quebec. A railway lawyer, Montrealer, close ally of Macdonald and patriotic Canadien, Cartier led Quebec into Confederation and helped negotiate the entry of the Northwest Territories, Manitoba, and British Columbia into Canada. Challenge in the West When Canada took over the vast northwest region from the Hudson's Bay Company in 1869, the 12,000 Métis of the Red River were not consulted. In response, Louis Riel led an armed uprising and seized Fort Garry, the territorial capital. Canada's future was in jeopardy. How could the Dominion reach from sea to sea if it could not control the interior? Ottawa sent soldiers to retake Fort Garry in 1870. Riel fled to the United States, and Canada established a new province, Manitoba. Riel was elected to Parliament, but never took his seat. Later, as Métis and Indian rights were again threatened by westward settlement, a second rebellion in 1885 in present-day Saskatchewan led to Riel's trial and execution for high treason a decision that was strongly opposed in Quebec. Riel is seen by many as a hero, a defender of Métis rights and the father of Manitoba. After the first Métis uprising, Prime Minister Macdonald established the Northwest Mounted Police in 1873 to pacify the West and assist in negotiations with the Indians. The Northwest Mounted Police founded Fort Calgary, Fort Macleod, and other centers that today are cities and towns. Regina became its headquarters. Today, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP, or the Mounties, are the national police force and one of Canada's best-known symbols. Some of Canada's most colorful heroes, such as Major General Sir Sam Steele, came from the ranks of the Mounties. Image of Fort Garry in 1863 with caption, the flag of the Hudson's Bay Company flew over Western Canada for 200 years before Confederation. Image of Sir Sam Steele as a great frontier hero, mounted policeman, and soldier of the Queen. Image of Gabriel Dumont as part of the Métis resistance. Gabriel Dumont was the Métis' greatest military leader. A railway from sea to sea. British Columbia joined Canada in 1871 after Ottawa promised to build a railway to the west coast. On November 7, 1885, a powerful symbol of unity was completed when Donald Smith, Lord Strathcona, the Scottish-born director of the Canadian Pacific Railway, or CPR, drove the last spike. The project was financed by British and American investors and built by both European and Chinese labour. Afterwards, the Chinese were subject to discrimination, including the head tax, a race-based entry fee. The Government of Canada apologized in 2006 for this discriminatory policy. After many years of heroic work, the CPR's ribbons of steel fulfilled a national dream. Image of a train and crew members with caption. Members of the train crew pose with a westbound Pacific Express at the first crossing of the Illicilua River near Glacier in British Columbia in 1886. Image of a Chinese worker's camp on the CPR, Kamloops, in British Columbia in 1886. Moving westward, Canada's economy grew and became more industrialized during the economic boom of the 1890s and early 1900s. One million British and one million Americans immigrated to Canada at this time. Sir Wilfrid Laurier became the first French-Canadian Prime Minister since Confederation and encouraged immigration to the West. His portrait is on the $5 bill. The railway made it possible for immigrants, including 170,000 Ukrainians, 115,000 Poles, and tens of thousands from Germany, France, Norway, and Sweden to settle in the West before 1914 and develop a thriving agricultural sector. The First World War 
Most Canadians were proud to be part of the British Empire. Over 7,000 volunteered to fight in the South African War from 1899 to 1902, popularly known as the Boer War, and over 260 died. In 1900, Canadians took part in the battles of Paardeburg, Horse Mountain, and Lillefontein, victories that strengthened national pride in Canada. When Germany attacked Belgium and France in 1914 and Britain declared war, Ottawa formed the Canadian Expeditionary Force, later the Canadian Corps. More than 600,000 Canadians served in the war, most of them volunteers, out of a total population of 8 million. On the battlefield, the Canadians proved to be tough, innovative soldiers. Canada shared in the tragedy and triumph of the Western Front. The Canadian Corps captured Vimy Ridge in April 1917 with 10,000 killed or wounded, securing the Canadians' reputation for valour as the shock troops of the British Empire. One Canadian officer said, It was Canada from the Atlantic to the Pacific on parade. In those few minutes, I witnessed the birth of a nation. April 9th is celebrated as Vimy Day. Regrettably, from 1914 to 1920, Ottawa interned over 8,000 former Austro-Hungarian subjects, mainly Ukrainian men, as enemy aliens in 24 labour camps across Canada, even though Britain advised against the policy. In 1918, under the command of General Sir Arthur Currie, Canada's greatest soldier, the Canadian Corps advanced alongside the French and British Empire troops in the last hundred days. These included the victorious Battle of Amiens on August 8, 1918, which the Germans called the Black Day of the German Army, followed by Arras, Canal du Nord, Cambrai, and Mons. With Germany and Austria's surrender, the war ended in the armistice on November 11, 1918. In total, 60,000 Canadians were killed and 170,000 wounded. The war strengthened both national and imperial pride, particularly in English Canada. Captions Image of a Sergeant, Fort Gary Horse of the Canadian Expeditionary Force in 1916. Image of Sir Arthur Curry, a reserve officer who became Canada's greatest soldier. Image of a cap badge with caption, Maple Leaf Cap Badge from the First World War. Canada's soldiers began using the maple leaf in the 1850s. Image of the Vimy Memorial with caption, the Vimy Memorial in France honors those who served and died in the Battle of Vimy Ridge on April 9, 1917, the first British victory of the First World War. Women get the vote. At the time of Confederation, the vote was limited to property-owning adult white males. This was common in most democratic countries at the time. The effort by women to achieve the right to vote is known as the Women's Suffrage Movement. Its founder in Canada was Dr. Emily Stowe, the first Canadian woman to practice medicine in Canada. In 1916, Manitoba became the first province to grant voting rights to women. In 1917, thanks to the leadership of women such as Dr. Stowe and other suffragettes, the federal government of Sir Robert Borden gave women the right to vote in federal elections first to nurses at the battlefront, then to women who were related to men in active wartime service. In 1918, most Canadian female citizens aged 21 and over were granted the right to vote in federal elections. In 1921, Agnes MacPhail, a farmer and teacher, became the first woman MP. Due to the work of Thérèse Casgrain and others, Quebec granted women the vote in 1940. Image of Agnes MacPhail. Image of a nurse with caption, more than 3,000 nurses, nicknamed Bluebirds, served in the Royal Canadian Army Medical Corps, 2,500 of them overseas. 
Canadians remember the sacrifices of our veterans and brave fallen in all wars up to the present day in which Canadians took part each year on November 11th, Remembrance Day. Canadians wear the red poppy and observe a moment of silence at the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month to honour the sacrifices of over a million brave men and women who have served and the 110,000 who have given their lives. Canadian Medical Officer Lieutenant Colonel John McRae composed the poem In Flanders Fields in 1915. It is often recited on Remembrance Day. In Flanders Fields the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row that mark our place, and in the sky the larks, still bravely singing, fly scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from failing hands we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Caption Images of Canadian soldiers observing Remembrance Day Of a Remembrance Day poppy Of a Canadian war veteran And of scouts holding a Remembrance Day wreath Between the Wars after the First World War, the British Empire evolved into a free association of states known as the British Commonwealth of Nations. Canada remains a leading member of the Commonwealth to this day, together with other successor states of the Empire such as India, Australia, New Zealand, and several African and Caribbean countries. The Roaring Twenties were boom times with prosperity for businesses and low unemployment. The stock market crash of 1929, however, led to the Great Depression, or the Dirty Thirties. Unemployment reached 27% in 1933, and many businesses were wiped out. Farmers in Western Canada were hit hardest by low grain prices and a terrible drought. There was growing demand for the government to create a social safety net with minimum wages, a standard work week, and programs such as unemployment insurance. The Bank of Canada, a central bank to manage the money supply and bring stability to the financial system, was created in 1934. Immigration dropped and many refugees were turned away, including Jews trying to flee Nazi Germany in 1939. Caption. Image of Phil Edwards with caption. Phil Edwards was a Canadian track and field champion. Born in British Guyana, he won bronze medals for Canada in the 1928, 1932, and 1936 Olympics, then graduated from McGill University Medical School. He served as a captain in the Canadian Army during the Second World War, and as a Montreal doctor, became an expert in tropical diseases. The D-Day Invasion, June 6, 1944 In order to defeat Nazism and Fascism, the Allies invaded Nazi-occupied Europe. Canadians took part in the liberation of Italy in 1943 to 1944. In the epic invasion of Normandy in northern France on June 6, 1944, known as D-Day, 15,000 Canadian troops stormed and captured Juneau Beach from the German army, a great national achievement. Approximately one in 10 Allied soldiers on D-Day was Canadian. The Canadian army liberated the Netherlands in 1944 to 1945 and helped force the German surrender of May 8, 1945, bringing to an end six years of war in Europe. Caption. Image of painting by Orville Fisher with caption in the Second World War, the Canadians captured Juneau Beach 
as part of the Allied invasion of Normandy on D-Day, June 6, 1944. The Second World War The Second World War began in 1939 when Adolf Hitler, the National Socialist Nazi dictator of Germany, invaded Poland and conquered much of Europe. Canada joined with its democratic allies in the fight to defeat tyranny by force of arms. More than one million Canadians and Newfoundlanders, at that time Newfoundland was a separate British entity, served in the Second World War out of a population of 11.5 million. This was a high proportion, and of these, 44,000 were killed. The Canadians fought bravely and suffered losses in the unsuccessful defense of Hong Kong in 1941 from attack by Imperial Japan and in a failed raid on Nazi-controlled Dieppe on the coast of France in 1942. The Royal Canadian Air Force took part in the Battle of Britain and provided a high proportion of Commonwealth air crew in bombers and fighter planes over Europe. Moreover, Canada contributed more to the Allied air effort than any other Commonwealth country, with over 130,000 Allied air crew trained in Canada under the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. The Royal Canadian Navy saw its finest hour in the Battle of the Atlantic, protecting convoys of merchant ships against German submarines. Canada's merchant navy helped to feed, clothe, and resupply Britain. At the end of the Second World War, Canada had the third largest navy in the world. In the Pacific War, Japan invaded the Aleutian Islands, attacked a lighthouse on Vancouver Island, launched fire balloons over BC and the prairies, and grossly maltreated Canadian prisoners of war captured at Hong Kong. Japan surrendered on August 14, 1945, the end of four years of war in the Pacific. Regrettably, the state of war and public opinion in BC led to the forcible relocation of Canadians of Japanese origin by the federal government and the sale of their property without compensation. This occurred even though the military and the Royal Canadian Mounted Police told Ottawa that they posed little danger to Canada. The government of Canada apologized in 1988 for wartime wrongs and compensated the victims. Modern Canada Trade and Economic Growth Post-war Canada enjoyed record prosperity and material progress. The world's restrictive trading policies in the Depression era were opened up by such treaties as the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, now the World Trade Organization. The discovery of oil in Alberta in 1947 began Canada's modern energy industry. In 1951, for the first time, a majority of Canadians were able to afford adequate food, shelter, and clothing. Between 1945 and 1970, as Canada drew closer to the United States and other trading partners, the country enjoyed one of the strongest economies among industrialized nations. Today, Canadians enjoy one of the world's highest standards of living, maintained by the hard work of Canadians and by trade with other nations, in particular the United States. As prosperity grew, so did the ability to support social assistance programs. The Canada Health Act ensures common elements and a basic standard of coverage. Unemployment insurance, now called employment insurance, was introduced by the federal government in 1940. Old age security was devised as early as 1927 and the Canada and Quebec pension plans in 1965. Publicly funded education is provided by the provinces and territories. Captions Image of a medical researcher Image of Toronto with caption Toronto's business district is also Canada's financial capital. International engagement Like Australia, New Zealand and other countries, Canada developed its autonomy gradually with a capacity to make significant contributions internationally. The Cold War began when several liberated countries of Eastern Europe became part of a communist bloc 
controlled by the Soviet Union under the dictator Joseph Stalin. Canada joined with other democratic countries of the West to form the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, a military alliance, and with the United States in the North American Aerospace Defense Command, or NORAD. Canada joined international organizations such as the United Nations, or UN. It participated in the UN operation defending South Korea in the Korean War in 1950 to 1953, with 500 dead and 1,000 wounded. Canada has taken part in numerous UN peacekeeping missions in places as varied as Egypt, Cyprus, and Haiti, as well as in other international security operations, such as those in the former Yugoslavia and Afghanistan. Canada and Quebec. French Canadian society and culture flourished in the post-war years. Quebec experienced an era of rapid change in the 1960s, known as the Quiet Revolution. Many Quebecers sought to separate from Canada. In 1963, Parliament established the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism. This led to the Official Languages Act of 1969, which guarantees French and English services in the federal government across Canada. In 1970, Canada helped found La Francophonie, an international association of French-speaking countries. The movement for Quebec sovereignty gained strength, but was defeated in a referendum in the province in 1980. After much negotiation in 1982, the constitution was amended without the agreement of Quebec. Though sovereignty was again defeated in a second referendum in 1995, the autonomy of Quebec within Canada remains a lively topic, part of the dynamic that continues to shape our country. A changing society. As social values changed over more than 50 years, Canada became a more flexible and open society. Many took advantage of expanding secondary and post-secondary educational opportunities, and a growing number of women entered the professional workforce. Most Canadians of Asian descent had in the past been denied the vote in federal and provincial elections. In 1948, the last of these, the Japanese Canadians, gained the right to vote. Aboriginal people were granted the vote in 1960. Today, every citizen over the age of 18 may vote. Canada welcomed thousands of refugees from communist oppression, including about 37,000 who escaped Soviet tyranny in Hungary in 1956. With the communist victory in the Vietnam War in 1975, many Vietnamese fled, including over 50,000 who sought refuge in Canada. The idea of multiculturalism as a result of 19th and 20th century immigration gained a new impetus. By the 1960s, one-third of Canadians had origins that were neither British nor French and took pride in preserving their distinct culture in the Canadian fabric. Today, diversity enriches Canadians' lives, particularly in our cities. Captions. Images of a Vietnamese Canadian parade and of an F-86 Sabre from the Royal Canadian Air Force. Arts and culture in Canada. Canadian artists have a long history of achievement in which Canadians take pride. Artists from all regions reflect and define our culture and forms of creative expression and have achieved greatness both at home and abroad. Canadians have made significant contributions to literature in English and in French. Novelists, poets, historians, educators and musicians have had a significant cultural impact. Men and women of letters included Stephen Leacock, Louis Aymon, Sir Charles G. D. Roberts, Pauline Johnson, Emile Nelligan, Robertson Davies, Margaret Lawrence, and Mordecai Richler. Musicians such as Sir Ernest Macmillan and Healy Willen won renown in Canada and abroad. 
Writers such as Joy Kagawa, Michael Ondaatje, and Rohinton Mystery have diversified Canada's literary experience. In the visual arts, Canada is historically perhaps best known for the Group of Seven, founded in 1920, who developed a style of painting to capture the rugged wilderness landscapes. Emily Carr painted the forests and Aboriginal artifacts of the West Coast. Les Automatistes of Quebec were pioneers of modern abstract art in the 1950s, most notably Jean-Paul Riepel. Quebec's Louis-Philippe Hébert was a celebrated sculptor of historical figures. Kenayuk Achivak pioneered modern Inuit art with etchings, prints, and soapstone sculptures. Canada has a long and respected performing arts history, with a network of regional theatres and world-renowned performing arts companies. The films of Denis Arcan have been popular in Quebec and across the country and have won international awards. Other noteworthy Canadian filmmakers include Norman Jewison and Atta Magoyan. Canadian television has had a popular following. Captions. Images of Cirque du Soleil and of Tom Thompson's painting, The Jack Pine. Sports have flourished as all provinces and territories have produced amateur and professional star athletes and Olympic medal winners. Basketball was invented by Canadian James Naismith in 1891. Many major league sports boast Canadian talent, and in the national sport of ice hockey, Canadian teams have dominated the world. In 1996, at the Olympic Summer Games, Donovan Bailey became a world record sprinter and double Olympic gold medalist. Chantal Petitclerc became a world champion wheelchair racer and Paralympic gold medalist. One of the greatest hockey players of all time, Wayne Gretzky, played for the Edmonton Oilers from 1979 to 1988. In 1980, Terry Fox, a British Columbian who lost his right leg to cancer at the age of 18, began a cross-country run, the Marathon of Hope, to raise money for cancer research. He became a hero to Canadians, while he did not finish the run and ultimately lost his battle with cancer. His legacy continues through yearly fundraising events in his name. In 1985, fellow British Columbian Rick Hansen circled the globe in a wheelchair to raise funds for spinal cord research. Canadian advances in science and technology are world-renowned and have changed the way the world communicates and does business. Marshall McLuhan and Harold Innes were pioneer thinkers. Science and research in Canada have won international recognition and attracted world-class students, academics and entrepreneurs engaged in medical research, telecommunications and other fields. Since 1989, the Canadian Space Agency and Canadian astronauts have participated in space exploration, often using the Canadian designed and built Canadarm. Gerhard Hertzberg, a refugee from Nazi Germany, John Polanyi, Sidney Altman, Richard E. Taylor, Michael Smith, and Bertram Brockhaus were Nobel Prize winning scientists. Captions Images of Donovan Bailey, Chantal Petitclerc, Terry Fox, and Wayne Gretzky. Image of Mark Tewksbury with caption Mark Tewksbury, Olympic gold medalist and prominent activist for gay and lesbian Canadians. Image of Paul Henderson with caption. In 1972, Paul Henderson scored the winning goal for Canada in the Canada-Soviet Summit Series. This goal is often referred to as the goal heard around the world and is still remembered today as an important event in both sports and cultural history. Image of Catriona LeMay Doan with caption, Catriona LeMay Doan carries the flag after winning a gold medal in speed skating at the 2002 Olympic Winter Games. Image of a Canadian football game with caption, Canadian football is a popular game that differs in a number of ways from American football. Professional teams in the Canadian Football League, CFL, 
compete for the championship Grey Cup, donated by Lord Grey, the Governor-General, in 1909. Great Canadian Discoveries and Inventions Canadians have made various discoveries and inventions. Some of the most famous are listed below. Alexander Graham Bell hit on the idea of the telephone at his summer house in Canada. Joseph Armand Bombardier invented the snowmobile, a lightweight winter vehicle. Sir Sanford Fleming invented the worldwide system of standard time zones. Matthew Evans and Henry Woodward together invented the first electric light bulb and later sold the patent to Thomas Edison, who more famously commercialized the light bulb. Reginald Fessenden contributed to the invention of radio, sending the first wireless voice message in the world. Dr. Wilder Penfield was a pioneering brain surgeon at McGill University in Montreal and was known as the greatest living Canadian. Dr. John A. Hobbs invented the first cardiac pacemaker used today to save the lives of people with heart disorders. Spar Aerospace and the National Research Council invented the Canadarm, a robotic arm used in outer space. Mike Lazaratis and Jim Balsillie of Research in Motion, a wireless communications company known for its most famous invention, the BlackBerry. Caption Image of Canadian scientific innovation at work with Canadarm 2. Image of Sir Frederick Banting with caption Sir Frederick Banting of Toronto and Charles Best discovered insulin, a hormone to treat diabetes that has saved 16 million lives worldwide. Want to learn more about Canada's history? Visit a museum or national historic site. Through artifacts, works of art, stories, images and documents, museums explore the diverse events and accomplishments that formed Canada's history. Museums can be found in almost every city and town across Canada. National historic sites are located in all provinces and territories and include such diverse places as battlefields, archaeological sites, buildings, and sacred spaces. To find a museum or national historic site in your community or region, visit the websites of the Virtual Museum of Canada and Parks Canada listed at the end of this guide. The prosperity and diversity of our country depend on all Canadians working together to face challenges of the future. In seeking to become a citizen, you are joining a country that with your active participation will continue to grow and thrive. How will you make your contribution to Canada? How Canadians Govern Themselves there are three key facts about Canada's system of government. Our country is a federal state, a parliamentary democracy, and a constitutional monarchy. Caption. Image of Queen Elizabeth II during the opening of the Parliament in 1957. Image of the Parliament Hill in Ottawa. Federal state. There are federal, provincial, territorial, and municipal governments in Canada. The responsibilities of the federal and provincial governments were defined in 1867 in the British North America Act, now known as the Constitution Act, 1867. In our federal state, the federal government takes responsibility for matters of national and international concern. These include defense, foreign policy, interprovincial trade and communications, currency, navigation, criminal law, and citizenship. The provinces are responsible for municipal government, education, health, natural resources, property and civil rights, and highways. The federal government and the provinces share jurisdiction over agriculture and immigration. Federalism allows different provinces to adopt policies tailored to their own populations and gives provinces the flexibility to experiment with new ideas and policies. Every province has its own elected legislative assembly, like the House of Commons in Ottawa. The three northern territories, which have small populations, do not have the status of provinces, but their governments and assemblies carry out many of the same functions. Parliamentary Democracy 
In Canada's parliamentary democracy, the people elect members to the House of Commons in Ottawa and to the provincial and territorial legislatures. These representatives are responsible for passing laws, approving and monitoring expenditures, and keeping the government accountable. Cabinet ministers are responsible to the elected representatives, which means they must retain the confidence of the House and have to resign if they are defeated in a non-confidence vote. Parliament has three parts, the Sovereign, a Queen or King, the Senate, and the House of Commons. Provincial legislatures comprise the Lieutenant Governor and the elected Assembly. In the federal government, the Prime Minister selects the Cabinet Ministers and is responsible for the operations and policy of the government. The House of Commons is the representative chamber made up of members of Parliament elected by the people traditionally every four years. Senators are appointed by the Governor-General on the advice of the Prime Minister and serve until age 75. Both the House of Commons and the Senate consider and review bills, which are proposals for new laws. No bill can become law in Canada until it has been passed by both chambers and has received royal assent granted by the Governor-General on behalf of the Sovereign. Living in a democracy, Canadian citizens have the right and the responsibility to participate in making decisions that affect them. It is important for Canadians aged 18 or more to participate in their democracy by voting in federal, provincial, or territorial and municipal elections. The following are the steps for the legislative process in Canada, or how a bill becomes law. Step 1 is called first reading. The bill is considered read for the first time and is printed. Step two is called second reading. In this step, members debate the bill's principle. Step three is the committee stage. At this stage, committee members study the bill clause by clause. Step four is the report stage. At this stage, members can make other amendments to the bill. Step five is called the third reading. At this stage, members debate and vote on the bill. Step six is the Senate stage. The bill will follow a similar process in the Senate. Step 7 is called Royal Assent. The bill receives Royal Assent after being passed by both Houses. Constitutional Monarchy As a constitutional monarchy, Canada's head of state is a hereditary sovereign, a queen or king, who reigns in accordance with the Constitution, the rule of law. The Sovereign is a part of Parliament, playing an important non-partisan role as the focus of citizenship and allegiance, most visibly during royal visits to Canada. Her Majesty is a symbol of Canadian sovereignty, a guardian of constitutional freedoms, and a reflection of our history. The Royal Family's example of lifelong service to the community is an encouragement for citizens to give their best to their country. As head of the Commonwealth, the Sovereign links Canada to 53 other nations that cooperate to advance social, economic, and cultural progress. Other constitutional monarchies include Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Australia, New Zealand, the Netherlands, Spain, Thailand, Japan, Jordan, and Morocco. There is a clear distinction in Canada between the head of state, the Sovereign, and the head of government, the Prime Minister, who actually directs the governing of the country. The Sovereign is represented in Canada by the Governor-General, who is appointed by the Sovereign on the advice of the Prime Minister, usually for five years. In each of the ten provinces, the Sovereign is represented by the Lieutenant Governor, who is appointed by the Governor-General on the advice of the Prime Minister, also normally for five years. The interplay between the three branches of governments, the Executive, Legislative and Judicial, which work together but also sometimes in creative tension, helps to secure the rights and freedoms of Canadians. Each provincial and territorial government has an elected legislature where provincial and territorial laws are passed. Depending on the province or territory, the members of the legislature are called members of the Legislative Assembly, or MLAs, members of the National Assembly, or MNAs, members of the Provincial Parliament, or MPPs, or members of the House of Assembly, or MHAs. In each province, the Premier has a role similar to that of the Prime Minister in the Federal Government, just as the Lieutenant Governor has a role similar to that of the Governor-General. 
In the three territories, the commissioner represents the federal government and plays a ceremonial role. Caption. Image of the Governor General David Johnston, Canada's 28th Governor General since the Confederation. Canada's System of Government. Parliament is comprised of three elements. The sovereign